Welcome to Pause for the Truth, where you can sit back, relax, and hear an honest dialogue about health, wealth, legal, and social issues. The hosts are Dr. Rogers Kane, family practice physician, and Jocelyn Turner, health education consultant, with co-hosts from the Northeast Florida Medical Society and its foundation. Stay tuned for the truth about matters affecting you and your family. We're here to tell you what's really going on and why. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Pause for the Truth. Tonight, as usual, we have a very engaging show. We have some great speakers. Tonight's topic is what every man needs to know about prostate cancer. And this is a topic that some men may not want to talk about. However, unfortunately, so many men have been diagnosed and it doesn't just affect the man. It also affects his entire family or circle of friends. Tonight we have joining us, our special guests are Dr. Herman Miller with a Women's Choice of Jacksonville, Dr. Christopher Williams with Urology Consultants, and Reverend Roger Williams with the Healthy Jacksonville Men's Health mm -hmm. Coalition. And of course, our distinguished co-host, Dr. Rogers Kane. How are you this evening, Dr. Kane? I am doing great, Ms. Turner, as usual. I can't complain. Both feet on this side of the dirt. Well, you know, as the old folks say, no need to complain, and we just do, we just deal with it. So, Dr. Kane, I don't know about you, but I am. This subject is very near and dear to my heart, as you know, having uh, been my father's physician and remembering his cancer, his prostate cancer diagnosis, and what's inspired me to join the movement or get into become a part of the movement to address men's health. So, I am super excited to learn more from our, for, from our guests and hope that our listeners will gain some insight for the men in their lives. Okay, so how about let's start with our first guest and ask him to tell us a little bit about him, himself. Dr. Miller, how are you this evening? This Android of mine, I don't know, maybe I need to go to an iPhone. You've been telling me that for the longest. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I love my there, Android. Look, but there are some flip phone fans out there, like my mother, who is kicking and screaming about getting into the uh, smartphone revolution. How about Dr. Christopher Williams? <laughs> Dr. Williams, are you are you on tonight? Can I, you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. How are you doing this evening, Dr. Williams? I am well. Thank you for the opportunity. Wonderful. I'm going to just give the spotlight on you for a second to just tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Okay. I'm Dr. Christopher Williams. I'm a urological oncologist, <clears throat> which means I have special training in um, taking care of cancers of the urinary system. I did uh, college and medical school at UNC Chapel Hill. I did my six years of surgery training at UAB. I did my two years of urologic oncology training at the National Cancer Institute at the NIH. Uh, and I joined UF Health here uh, in 2005, and I um, was there for about 14 years. I started the robotic surgery program there, and I was in charge of urological oncology there for well over a decade. I started my own practice called Urology Consultants about two and a half years ago. And in my current practice, I'm not doing the big operations like I used to do for all of those many, many years. Um, but I, I really try to help guide people through their, their uh, journey. Uh, when they're diagnosed with uh, urological cancers, such as prostate cancer. Um, and we do some other general things too, but that my passion is, of course, urological oncology since I spent so much time uh, doing that training. Um, so I'm happy here to be here tonight to uh, answer questions about prostate cancer in particular. And, and thank you, Dr. Williams. And I want you to, our listeners to know that Dr. Williams I mean, almost every time we ask him to get in front of an audience to educate men about prostate cancer, if his schedule permits, he's always there. So I just want to say publicly thank you for always making yourself available to educate the community, to help folks understand as much as they can about prostate cancer or any other uro uro urology issues that they may have. So 
Thanks again for that. We'll move on to Reverend Roger Williams. Good Hi. evening. Can you hear me, Jocelyn? Yes. How you doing, Reverend Williams? I am doing well. That sounds so formal. <laughs> How you doing, Roger? <laughs> <laughs> and we can do Who that. Who are you talking to? <laughs> we can do that because Jocelyn and I, we go, we go way back to probably our freshman year at the University of Florida. Go um, Gators, yes. Go Gators. I am um, uh, Reverend William, no, Roger Williams. Start, I'm, the, I'm the pastor of uh, Philip R. Cousin uh, AME Church in Mandarin uh, off of Orange Picker Road. I am a graduate, as Jocelyn said, of the University of Florida with degrees in journalism and law. I'm a practicing attorney with the Department of Children and Families. And because of my, uh, my history, um, Jocelyn mentioned her father's history. My father also had um, prostate cancer and had the surgery, but he, he was back in the day when you had to have the big scar and he was not very happy about that, I will tell you. Um, but he passed not due to prostate cancer, but from uh, high blood pressure and stroke. So um, I've always been interested in men's health. And when an opportunity came through the Department of Health and Jocelyn and our friendship and our relationship to participate with uh, the Healthy Jacksonville Men's Health Coalition and to help get that off the ground, um, we were able to uh, get that started along with Jocelyn and some other persons who wanted to join a coalition of persons looking to educate men about their health. And so I've been, we've now been involved probably about 11 years or so. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. I really appreciate it. And, and Roger, again, I have to also publicly acknowledge him because he has been a real champion for men's health. Uh, and as he mentioned that, you know, every year for the past more than 12 years, actually, Roger, mm -hmm. we've held a health summit for men called Man Up. So I'd like to tell our audience to stay tuned. We'll tell you more about that later. Dr. Miller, are you on? I don't want to leave you out because we definitely want to hear your story tonight, Dr. Miller. So we'll let our behind the scenes person who really is the uh one part of the puzzle that helps to make this happen, and that's called Tyrone. Tyrone is our uh, technology expert that helps with the behind the scenes for this podcast. So I'm sure as he's probably listening and working diligently with Dr. Miller to get him on. So we're going to go ahead and get started with the questions. And I'd like to, and, and Roger, you've kind of answered the question, but um, I'm just going to start out by asking you and all of all of you, we hear a lot about women's health and the health of children. Why is it important to talk about men's health? And Roger, I'm going to start with you. You kind of alluded to it based on your personal experience with your father. Well, I, I think it's important because probably more uh, all of the men on this show, uh, whether they're uh, professionals or, um, well, I, I'm not going to speak about the professionals, but I know most men don't like going to the doctor. They're very uh, afraid of uh, when you talk about the, uh, the, the, the test, I'm sure that Dr. Williams has performed many times. Um, the digital exam for prostate, they, they're very leery of that. And um, we men usually wait until the last moment uh, when a number of the diseases that impact us are very preventable. And so um, I think that just as women are, are not afraid of going and getting their annual checkups, each man should have uh, an annual checkup. And we wanted to educate men and also with the Health, Healthy Jacksonville Men's Health Coalition, we reach out to young men and youth trying to get them to have a better understanding about what a healthy lifestyle is about and the importance of testing. And so uh, I think that it's important for us to have this discussion uh, to take away some of the fears, because if you know that, and I'll get this up front, I usually say <clears throat> each man should want to walk their daughter down the aisle if they have a daughter or if they have a, um, a son to see him stand up and take his bride and start a family. And too many of us are dying very young. So that's part of the 
reason that I want us to have, or I want to participate in this discussion tonight about men's health. And thank you. And you always say that, Roger, that, you know, you want to you want to be around for your own your own grandchildren one day. And so this is a very important discussion. Dr. Williams, why is it important to talk about men's health? Um, as Roger said, we you know, women will go to the doctor and no big deal. It's just it's just a way of life for us. But what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I, I think that, you know, I would like for it to be kind of old hat for us to talk about men's health. It should be just part of our, our everyday conversations. You know, we should, it shouldn't be this kind of taboo thing that we kind of talk about, you know, in a hush hush manner because there are all these fears and misconceptions and things of that sort. So I think the more that we talk about it out in the open, the more it becomes kind of just mainstream conversation. Hey man, you get your PSA. Hey, you get your rectal exam. It's not that big a deal. You know, when it becomes not that big a deal to talk about, it won't be that big a deal to get it done. So those are my thoughts about it. You're right, because as ladies, we'll talk in a minute about when the last time we had our pap test or or let me tell you about my mammogram. So you're right. Thank you. Dr. Miller, what about you? We hear a lot about women's health and the health of children. Why is it important to talk about men's health? And Dr. Kane? How about you take the next one now? Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. After, uh, as you're aware, I've worked with uh, you and Herman in the you and Herman, you and uh, uh, Roger in the past with the Men's Health Coalition, and uh, I felt like it was important work because I've to I take care of patients, and they, as you are saying, have, as you have said, they tend to minimize their need to be. Uh, um, taken care of from a health standpoint, uh, unlike women. Women will be there, do the things they need to do uh, to make sure they stay healthy. Uh, I say healthy, wealthy, and wise. Uh, but um, as as a man, I know a lot of us, we tend to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, trying to be macho, we tend not to go to the doctor like we should. And physicians, a lot of physicians tend not to do it as they should. Um, I've had physician friends who have died uh, unnecessarily uh, because they didn't take care of themselves. They took good care of everybody else, but mm -hmm. so I pledged that I would not be one of those guys. And so uh, one of my physicians is on the phone. I mean, is on this program with me uh, because I sought I sought their help in making sure I stayed healthy uh, from a male standpoint. So. Uh, is I'm going to ask one more time. Is Dr. Miller are you now able to speak? Uh, oh, I was hoping Tyrone got that uh, mic taken care of. No, he's still having technical issues. Okay. okay. All right. So, all right. So, um, let's just ask this. Put this out front. How does a man know if he has any uh, has prostate problem? Um, well, first of all, what's the prostate and what does it do? And this is probably going to go to Dr. Uh, Chris Williams, uh, what is a prostate and what is its function? <clears throat> so the prostate is a, is the male sex gland and it's situated right below the bladder. Um, and it's between essentially the penis and the bladder and the urethra runs through it. The urethra is the, is the water channel. So urine is stored in the bladder. It runs from the bladder through the urethra which runs through the prostate and then into the penis and then out. The prostate is also situated right in front of the rectum. And that's one reason why we can feel the prostate on the rectal exam um, because it's so close to the rectum. But the function is it, it, um, it has uh, proteins that it makes. Um, some of them are, are um, involved in making testosterone into a form that can be used easily by the prostate. But the other function of the prostate is that when you ejaculate, when a man ejaculates, it, the, most of the ejaculate comes from the seminal vesicles, which are glands on the backside of the prostate. And that fluid then enters the prostate. The prostate breaks it down into a, a, a less viscous fluid so they can flow more easily um, when it's ejaculated outside of the body. So without the prostate, it will be too thick and it won't come out. Um, and of course, like I told you also, the prostatic urethra runs through the prostate. Um, so it's, it can have a, uh, a function related to urination in, in terms of if it gets too large on the inside, then it can 
pinch shut that urethra and make it hard for a man to empty his bladder. So um, it's a male uh, uh, gland that's involved in, in those functions. Well, one of the things I, I do, um, the only other thing I usually add to some of my patients, just uh, and this is from a layman's level, I let them know that prostate, prostatic secretion fluid is kind of help give food to the sperm uh, in their quest, because uh, that's the, the quest of the sperm is to uh, impregnate uh, you know, women, um, you know, uh, fertilize the egg, the ovum, whatever, um, during uh, uh, after sex, during sex and after sex. So I let them know that some of that fluid is for sure. It helped provide food for those sperms to be able to continue their movement and, and, and uh, obtain their mission. Um, so what are some of the symptoms um, that um, let me put it this way. How does a man know if he has prostate problems, uh, Dr. Uh, Williams? And yeah, what I are think, some of the warning signs of prostate cancer? Okay. So one reason why I, um, I mentioned the, the impact that the prostate can have on urination is because I think we need to first um, kind of split up our talk on whether we're talking about prostate cancer symptoms or prostate enlargement symptoms. And that's really important because many men come into our office and, and they are having, you know, symptoms of prostate enlargement and they think, oh my gosh, this is related to cancer. And most of the time it is not. So let's talk about uh, enlarged prostate symptoms first. So because the urethra runs through the prostate, um, if the inside of the prostate gets too large, it can pinch shut or impinge the urethra and make it harder for somebody to empty their bladder. So it makes it harder for them to urinate. And so those are the problems that we people, uh, men will usually have when you're having, uh, you've, heard, you've heard of BPH or benign prostatic hypertrophy or hyperplasia, uh, that's enlarged prostate basically. And so the symptoms of that are, okay, straining to urinate, um, having to go to the bathroom a lot. I just finished peeing, I gotta go back again because they're not emptying their bladder well. Um, it could be what we call hesitancy, where the, the patient will stand there or the man is standing there for a long time uh, trying to urinate before something comes out. Um, it could be what we call nocturia, getting up a lot at night to urinate because the, the uh, man hasn't emptied his bladder very well uh, during the day. And then as a natural process of getting the fluid off of the body at night called diuresis, the bladder starts to fill up with urine. Well, there's already a lot of urine sitting there waiting on him. Then that man, that man has to get up a lot at night to urinate. Um, so some of these are some of the symptoms of an enlarged prostate, those urinary type symptoms. Um, and those are not to be confused with, with prostate cancer type symptoms. So let's switch gears and I'll talk a little bit about prostate cancer type symptoms. By and large, because of PSA, which is prostate specific antigen, which is a blood test that we use to screen for prostate cancer, and then just prostate cancer screening in general, we don't have very many symptoms of prostate cancer anymore. So in, the, in a population like the United States, where people should be getting screened for prostate cancer, we don't see symptomatic prostate cancer that often. But let's just say when somebody hasn't gotten screened properly and the prostate cancer has gotten very bad, what kind of symptoms might they see? Well, in that case, if the prostate cancer grows up toward the bladder and invades the bladder, um, or then it might result in blood in the urine, um, it could grow, even grow up into the bladder to the extent that it could block one of the ureters and the patient could be having back pain. Um, typically, a lot of the prostate cancer symptoms would have to do with bone pain because the prostate has a predisposition or predilection for uh, spreading to bones, especially like the spine. Um, and people will have um, you know, pain in, in their spine and in other places that, of the body where the prostate cancer has spread to. But these are very advanced uh, cases of prostate cancer where somebody's actually symptomatic. So that's the reason why screening is important because when when you become symptomatic from prostate cancer, it usually means it's not curable. So you don't ever want to have prostate cancer symptoms, and we don't often see that. Got it. So one of the things we, and that's why you're saying get early screening for prostate cancer so that, because uh, late in the game, may be too late in the game. Correct. Is that what I'm hearing? That's exactly right. what you're okay. hearing. You're having symptoms from yeah, prostate okay. cancer is a bad thing. Right. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to uh, ask this one and then, uh, uh, Dr. Miller, are you 
Did we finally get him connected? Uh, apparently not. So, uh, Mr. Turner, go on ahead and get, um, you can grab the next question, please, ma'am. So, Dr. Dr. Williams and, and, and Roger, I promise we're going to get back to you, but I want to stay on this topic of prostate cancer. What age should men be screened for prostate cancer, Dr. Williams? <clears throat> so, that gets really um, tricky for the public because there are so many guidelines that come out from different organizations regarding screening for prostate cancer. But, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of some of the, the larger organizations that, you know, we can give the most weight to, such as American Urological Association, which is the largest body of urologists in the world, um, they recommend screening the average risk, okay, average, hear me out, average risk person starting at age 55, okay? But the people who are not average risk are high, considered high risk, and those would be people who are African-American men and also men who have family histories of prostate cancer. So brothers with prostate cancer, fathers with prostate cancer, uncles with prostate cancer, you know, these are men who are considered high risk. And so for the high risk individuals, then the National Comprehensive Cancer Network recommends starting to screen those patients at 40 or 45. I like 40. Most of the, um, uh, like the National Medical Association, which is the largest group of, of African-American doctors, um, we all recommend in, in, that, in that body that African-American men start being, being screened at age 40, which was even the recommendation for um, the American Neurological Association for many, many years as well. But they've kind of drifted away from paying attention, honestly, to those who are at highest risk and they've kind of con they've kind of concentrated or their focus on people who are at average risks. But African American men and men with family histories of prostate cancer really should start to be screened at age forty, and that screening should consist of a PSA. That's that blood test that I told you about, um, and the PSA is prostate specific antigen. It is basically a a protein in the in the body that's pretty much only made by the prostate and the and the tissues around the prostate. So if it's high. That's just a red flag to check that person. Something's going on with the prostate. The other part of screening is called a digital rectal exam. And that's where the doctor puts a glove finger into the, into the rectum of the man and compresses the prostate, presses on it to feel if there are hard spots in the prostate. The prostate should not feel um, hard. It should be kind of, kind of rubbery, soft rubbery, but it should not feel like, a, like it has marbles in it. If it has hard spots in it, that's a, a red flag that could potentially be cancer and that should be taken very seriously. So those are the main um, screening methods that are recommended for um, high risk individuals starting at age uh, 40. And in terms of how often it should be done, again, most of the, the groups that um, focus on African-American annual screening, the, um, the National Conference of Cancer Network, has kind of waffled back and forth in the last couple of years. I think last year they were saying do it, start it, do it every year. And then they're saying now you can do it every other year. I don't ever try to minimize screening uh, in high risk individuals. I will take the most aggressive approach because we're dealing with life and death. Thank you. And yeah, I, I and remember I, when I, my I, dad got when my, I'm sorry, Dr. Kane. I remember when my dad was diagnosed, uh, immediate, immediately I told my brothers that they needed to make sure that they get screened for prostate cancer, or at least told them that now they are at greater risk. And unfortunately, they were already at risk because they're black men. Right. But the, but once my, my, you know, our dad was diagnosed and, and Roger, I'm sure you probably did the same within your own family when your dad was diagnosed, hopefully you all had a conversation with the males in your family. Is that right? Um, everyone in the family. One of the other things I, I usually share is that when a family member is dealing with a serious health issue, it impacts all of the family. And so all of us um, made sure that we um, got tested. And because of my high blood pressure, I... Um, have been going to see my doctor on an annual basis. And um, I, I, because of my family history, I also have a specialist uh, that I see about my prostate. And so uh, again, the, the issue of exchanging information and 
sharing family history, because some of our families, we don't know our family medical history. And I think it's important in diseases like this that are that run in the family, uh, they, they, they're, the likelihood of a son, uh, I mean, a, a, a son having prostate cancer after his father or siblings, um, it's, it's important that all of us um, seek testing. And the one yeah, thing you said, and, and, and then, Dr. Kane, I'm going I'm to turn it over to you. Let me just make this one last statement I want to get out. One thing you said, Roger, that I'd like for our listeners to really think about, you know, oftentimes when we're doing our family tree for family reunions, we, we want to know who all of our family members are, our ancestors and stuff. It's important as you're doing the family tree that you also do a family health tree right next to each person's name, any illnesses they have, live, if the person is living or if they've passed already, because sometimes some families have, have rare diseases in their family and it's important to make sure that that's noted within your family tree. Go ahead, take it away. Well, yeah, I was gonna just add as a primary care physician, um, um, the, the, the one thing that, uh, uh, when Dr. Williams mentioned about the, uh, which is one of the questions, but he went on ahead and answered it anyway, the age at which they start screening for prostate cancer, you know, and 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 also as me being a uh, uh, the caregiver for many black males, I am very aggressive with them in terms of at least doing a, some level of screening, if nothing but a PSA um, uh, for uh, prostate cancer starting at the age of forty. I'm um, I, I took one of those and every year at that. So I, I take the approach as a primary care physician, especially working in a, uh, a black community, uh, to be very aggressive with the screening aspect of prostate cancer. So I start at 40 and, and don't look back and, uh, and take them up until a certain age, which um, I may back off somewhat in terms of aggressiveness of screening. I probably... Uh, when you start getting those 85 and 90 year olds, then the risk may not uh, outweigh the uh, the risk may outweigh the benefit in terms of being too aggressive with uh, prostate cancer. But I let Dr. Williams address that if he chooses to do so. I will ask. Um, so since we talked about the age of uh, which you know prostate cancer should be screened for, and we discussed on the surface about the race and the family history of a, a man's risk for being diagnosed prostate cancer. What other risk factors are there uh, to developing uh, prostate cancer? Are there other major risk factors other than just their race, uh, Dr. Williams? Those are the, the two, the two main ones are really family history and and, and race, and not only just African American race, the Ashkenazi Jews also are at high risk for, of developing um, prostate cancer as well. Um, but you know what? I think one other risk factor um, we could consider would be kind of the American diet, because our mm -hmm. diet is high in fatty foods and fried foods and low in fruits and vegetables most of the time. You know, we have a lot of fast foods that don't you know give you a lot of nutrition. And you kind of compare our prostate cancer rates to those in, we'll say, like Asian countries where they eat a lot of, you know, vegetables and soy products and things of that sort. Our rates are very, very much higher. And so I, I think I think this the American diet probably is is certainly a risk factor as well. So are there any medications that put a person at high risk for prostate cancer that, that you're aware of? Well, so there was there were some tests, some studies done with some of the medications that shrink the prostate, such as finasteride and dutasteride, and um, at least one of those studies found a, a higher risk of of more like intermediate risk prostate cancers instead of low risk prostate cancers in the group that was getting that. But that that study's been scrutinized a lot because you know some some of it may have been sampling error, meaning that. In the mm -hmm. patients who get, were getting the, the the drug, their prostates were smaller. And so, for example, if you are going to take twelve needle cores from a prostate the size of a walnut, and you're still going to take twelve, and there's cancer in there, you're more likely to hit it 
than if you take 12 samples through a tennis ball, which is a little bit bigger. Um, so, right. you know, it, it's harder to ferret out if that was real or not. And, and it's not it, the, it wasn't so convincing that, you know, urologists felt like, you know, it was no longer a good drug to use those drugs. And, and I still use them too, because I, I just don't, I don't think that that data was, um, it was clean enough to stop using a drug that's, that's otherwise so much helpful for some patients. Um, other than that, I can't think of any other medications that um, really put anybody at risk for prostate cancer. Uh, agreed. I can't think of any off the top of my head. Um, the, what about other diseases that may increase your risk for developing prostate cancer? Um, again, you know, the studies that I can't. looked at, you know, some there may be some risk associated with obesity, but then, you know, you look at studies done you know, and some patients who have gotten prostate cancer treatment and then some of the people who are obese have done better. So it's, it's really tough to say that there are any other diseases that, you know, put you at more risk for having prostate cancer. But in general, it seems that it makes more sense to live and be healthy and, um, and active as best you can. And that will help things. Um, certainly nobody would want to be obese in terms of trying to increase their ability to uh, have a better outcome from prostate cancer. A lot of these studies are, it's, it's, they're so biased and, and they're not clean data that you can't put a lot of stock in it because some of these things just intuitively don't make any sense too. And I asked that question because a lot of people still go and go to the Google machine and uh, uh, may come up with some false misinformation about prostate cancer um, mm -hmm. that, 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 um, as it relates to uh, uh, other diseases and other medications causing increased risk for prostate cancer. Uh, Ms. Turner, you can go ahead and, and, and ask the following questions, please, ma'am. So one of the things, since I've been working with men's health for the past more than 12 years, the subject that's come up so often has been men and performance and that is sexual activity. I know I've had folks to call me because they know that I've been involved in, in men's health. They've Ladies, they've called and said, you know, please, I need some help trying to figure out how to talk to my man about the importance of going in for tests and also of, of just, you know, taking your medication and not worrying about sexual activity. So, Dr. Williams, does your degree of sexual activity increase or affect development of prostate cancer? No, not that we know of. And and yep. and Dr. Kane, point. I'm gonna ask you, <laughs> Dr. Kane, I'm just gonna ask you, I'm gonna I'm gonna go off the, the beaten path and just ask you a little bit about, you know, why should why should men not take their medication, their blood pressure medicine or other medication like that? worrying about performance and sexual activity. Why is that not a good idea to stop taking those medicines? Well, um, you know, I have a lot of men that come in and say, doctor, you know, I don't really want to get on blood pressure medicine because, you know, it may bother with my, uh, as the old folks used to say, my Johnson. It may not, uh, uh, it may cause some erectile dysfunction. So I'm quick to tell them it's like, Look, we can help most of the time with erectile dysfunction that might be caused by uh, blood pressure medicine or as a side effects of the medication. But when you get that erectile dysfunction that's caused by stroke, uh, that is a whole different ball game. And a lot of times we can't help you with that one. So the best thing to do is to make sure you treat your other diseases, the other comorbidities, uh, as in high blood pressure and diabetes, and cholesterol, uh, those three main things that increase your risk for stroke, heart attack, blah, 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 blah. You take those, and even if you get, and Dr. Williams can expand on this uh, uh, even more, even if you get some erectile dysfunction from those medications, uh, much of that we can fix, okay, with the different um, uh Viagra-type medicines that they have out there these days, as long as 
uh, we've, we're given the opportunity to, uh, for early intervent intervention with prostate-related issues, and uh, we can uh, fix a whole lot of erectile dysfunction uh, concerns that a person may have uh, because they're being treated for other disease states. Anything uh, in addition to that, uh, Dr. Williams, that you're? Well, I mean, I, I agree that, you know, those other problems that like stroke and, and cardiovascular disease, things that could, you know, kill you, you know, those things need to be paid attention to quite a bit more than than your erection. Side, you can't worry about having a direction. So. Um, I think that's important. Yeah. Just as simple as that. So I have a very, uh, I have an unusual question to ask, but it's been asked of me um, by someone just sent me the message. Is there any special um, issues around gay men and prostate cancer or prostate health issues? No, not that I've that I know of. I mean, we screen gay men the same way we screen everyone else. We don't we don't think that there's an increased risk of prostate cancer in gay men, and you know they still have prostate. You know, unless their prostate's been removed for some reason, they still have prostates. And so, as long as their prostate is in place, then they're at risk for prostate cancer. So they need to be screened just like everyone else. Thank you, and and how can ladies help the men in their lives focus on their health? And this is to either of you, Dr. Williams or Dr. Kane, or even Roger. Why don't we let Reverend Roger handle that one at first? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, my, my, my wife, um, sometimes I have, I, have mem I have memory issues with my calendar and my, my wife usually stays on me. Um, and sometimes she will attend some of my uh, appointments because we, we both see the same primary care physician. Uh, and I, I think the, the, you know, health should not be a solo uh, tr event. I mean, the, the whole household, uh, husbands, wives, children, everybody should be concerned about our health, especially <clears throat> when you consider the impact of a number of diseases uh, in the African-American community. And diet certainly serves a, a big deal uh, with that. Um, and so I think it's important that, um, and, and sometimes I go to her appointments, um, um, and not necessarily, you know, because she can't drive, but, you know, sometimes it's, it's good to know that someone has your back and someone has your support. And I think that's always a, a, a great factor because a lot of, many of us, we worry, you know, and, and worry also, and stress also brings on. Um, negative uh, health concerns. So I think it's really important for us to have support. And whether if you don't, if you're not married, you have a significant other. Um, and you know there are no real HIPAA issues. Um, and you don't mind sharing um, the um, appointments and so forth. I think having having support. It's tough going through this stuff alone especially when you're going to get a test and you're very concerned as to whether cancer is going to show up or some other uh, health concern. I think it's really important from a spiritual and a and an emotional standpoint to have someone there to be with you. Well, don't forget about let, daughters because I was actually there with my, I'm sorry, Dr. King. Don't forget about daughters because I was actually at my dad's appointments with him. Well, I was going to say, uh, yeah, yeah, I do know you were there. Um, the, I was going to also uh, allude to uh, the fact what Dr. Williams, uh, Reverend Williams said was uh, absolutely correct. And I tend to utilize uh, the spouses and or uh, children uh, presence uh, during the uh, office visit because they tell things that the husband is not, uh, the father is not in a, a big hurry to tell and bring that to my attention in which I address rather readily uh, before I have to send them off to someone like Dr. Williams, whom his specialty is, uh, you know, uh, urological oncology. So I'm usually that gatekeeper to help try to uh, uh, make sure men stay healthy uh, about a whole lot of things. But when it comes down to prostate it related issues or concern, and I have not uh, I reached the um, 
the limit that I can, like I, I've said to many of my patients, I'm a jack of all trades and a master of none. But when I get to a certain point that I need to recruit help as far as it relates to prostate, I will call on people like Dr. Williams, uh, especially Dr. Williams. I will call on him to uh, take it. You know, I punt the ball to him and ask him, can he move this further toward the goalpost in terms of his resolution? Also, the, the family members tend to give us uh, other ideas uh, as to what to look for, what, may, what else may be going on with that patient that they're probably not in a hurry to tell. I have many women come in and say, can you help him with his other problem? And of course, he drops his head uh, you know, at that time. And the other problem usually means erectile dysfunction, um, in which I say, yes, I can. But what we need to do is to take care. Let's look at a whole bunch of this other stuff, you know, the other core morbidities like diabetes and high blood pressure, and cholesterol, other cardiovascular related issues. Let's look at those and while we work up this prostate so we can put them in the best position to deal with prostate cancer if it winds up being diagnosed. You know, you don't need prostate cancer if you can help it. You don't want prostate cancer and you've had two heart attacks. You know, you want to take care of both and you can walk and chew gum and do all of this at the same time, especially as a primary care provider. We have to do it. So I'm very in favor of family members coming in and seeing uh, and, and visiting with um uh, uh, participating in the care of their loved one. R remember, if a, if a guy has a stroke or has significant prostate issues, um, when they're down and can't do for themselves, who does that burden fall to? It falls on those family members. And for a person who has an opportunity to minimize the, 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 the effects of a disease that can put them in really, really bad position of being able to care for themselves, uh, that person should do everything they can to keep their family member from having to deal with um, uh, that they can, as I say, like, let me make sure I make this clear. Everything that they can to keep their family member from having to um, do a, um, uh, to take care of that person. So, if he has a, he or she has a stroke, and we're talking about men this evening, so I say men. But if, if a man has a stroke, then the person or people that's there to help take care of him when he can't do it for himself are those family members. And so to put them in that position of not participating well in your care before you get to that stroke is unfair to those family members. Uh, to put them in such a position that 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 could have been avoided if they just paid greater attention to their health needs as the family wants them to do. I know that was a little verbose, but I can't emphasize enough that, that we were, as men, we really need to take care of ourselves. Thank you. Is Dr. Miller, is Dr. Miller live yet? Dr. Miller, can you, is your, uh, I know you've been having some technical issues. Can you say something that's, we, I just want to see if we can hear you. I'm so sorry you're having technical issues. We couldn't bring you in. But uh, Dr. Williams, is there anything you'd like to say on on how ladies can help men focus on their health? Well, one thing I've noticed um, when, you know, a couple comes in and we're discussing, we'll say the man's prostate cancer, you know, every treatment option has some side effect to it. And when the... Um, the wife or significant other comes with the man is it's really helpful because it's almost like, you know, he, he gets permission from his wife that certain things are either not okay or are okay. For instance, I had a patient, you know, and the treatment option that um, was best for him, you know, had a risk of erectile dysfunction, but she was there saying, I don't care. I want you to live. Let's do whatever is most aggressive. And that's, I mean, that was really supportive for him, you know, because that was a big concern of his. And I was like, hey, we can help you with your erections, you know, lots of different ways. But, you know, she really gave him that, that boost saying, hey, let's not worry about that right now. Let's worry about 
being as aggressive as you can about this cancer that's aggressive. And we can worry about the other stuff later. Um, because many times the, the men will just choose something that, you know, while what's important to them is important, obviously. But like Dr. Kane says, you know, many times, you know, that other personal family member is going to be having to deal with, um, you know, taking care of them and their cancer. So, you know, if they have permission from their family to be as aggressive as possible, you know, even though there might be some some side effects that the man might really not want. But if he's if he hears from his family, hey, that's OK, let's deal with that. Let's 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 put the let's put the emphasis on what's important, most important. And I think that's really helpful. So that's one thing that I, I would add. Thank you. I want to follow up with the question by asking all uh, all of you. Some men get motivation to focus on their health from their families or because they think about the health of their fathers. What's your motivation? Dr. Williams, I'll start with you. Motivation to um, to focus on your own health. health. Mm -hmm. Focus on my own health. Um, well, like Dr. Kane says, you know, my family is certainly the probably the biggest motivation because I don't want them to have to, uh, uh, you know, do without or, or have to care for me when there's something I can do to, to prevent that. That's probably my biggest motivation for, for my own health and just, you know, just uh, self-preservation. I mean, I want to be here too. So but as, as a, <laughs> Terrell, like Terrell Owen said, the football play, I love you some me. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks for your honesty. You're probably, so so used to helping other people navigate that, but for the table to be turned to say, what's your motivation? And and I want to piggyback on that. Um, and I really wanted to ask Dr. Miller this question, but you know, as as and and this is going to be directed to any of you, but especially the doctors, as you personally have had to deal with any health issue, how scary is it, or? What's your what's your how's your mental health when you have detected something either in yourself or when you've had to deal with the health issue of a family member? How, how How's your mental health in dealing with that as a physician? When someone mentions to you, poor Dr. Kane, you know, I, you know, if I start feeling a little something, something, I call him and say, what is this something that I'm feeling? But just in general. How do you handle that when you get those, you know, that news sometimes that's not already, or even when someone just asks you the question and the red flag goes up in your mind? I'll, I'll jump in right quick. Um, a couple of things. Uh, I'm going to go back and, and kind of answer a little uh, of the previous question and, and bring it into the, the, this present question. You know, one thing that I've always uh, uh, had a prayer for was that, you know, I'll ask uh, uh, from early on in life uh, with, I mean, family, as far as the family is concerned, I just say, Good Lord, Lord, if you just let me live to be at least, uh, get old enough to see my youngest child be 25, which I felt like at that age, I was able to provide them much of what they need uh, to be able to survive in life without me. I'm not saying I wanted them to, but, you know, to survive without me, you know, then I felt if I got to be 25, anything, I, I mean, they got to be 25, anything that uh, as, as it relates to my health uh, and surviving it after that point is gravy. Now, once they got there, because my, my youngest child did get to be 25 six years back, at least <laughs> six or seven years back, I did say, well, you don't have to, you know, you let you, you, you fulfill your end of the bargain. Uh, and but, so, but I'm, you're not I'm, ready to I'm go willing. yet. Well, I, yeah, but you don't have to, you know, <laughs> you don't have to honor that just yet, you know. But, but I left it up to them because they fulfill the end of the bargain. Now, with that also being said, with because of so much, and especially recently with COVID, because of so much death, and I don't, I'm gonna say destruction, but not in terms of a, 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 a physical mean, but because of so much death, it has really. Uh, humble me and, and and to to recognize that I am just as human as uh, uh, the next man and I'm not a superman as it relates to my health and 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 and, and, and a false belief that it'll happen to everybody else. It can happen to anybody else, it can happen to me. 
And so I accept that and I accept the responsibility that's associated with that. And that is to take better care of myself so I can help my family. They might have gotten to be 25 and older, but I still got a lot in terms of wisdom to offer them. Now, not everybody say I'm that wise, but still, I feel I have enough and wisdom to offer my family, uh, despite um, uh, them getting older and, uh, and and making sure that they don't think I'm the, how do they say it? Once an adult, twice a child, you know, your children start treating you like you're the child. But that's welcome because that means they've gotten right. old enough that I can deal with them. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Dr. K. Dr. Williams, what about you? Well, I mean, I think kind of like Dr. King said, you know, um, you, you just realize that, you know, you can be the patient too. And, you know, I've been the patient before too. And uh, that's certainly a humbling experience. And, uh, you know, being on the other side of it is is, is, a, is an eye-opening experience. And if you ever have to be there, it's nice to know that you, you know, you don't have any bad vibes coming back at you because you've been nice to people. Um, <laughs> uh, remember that nurse you told me about <laughs> so that's important you know and just um, understanding that you know it can happen to you you know you're not immune from you know disease as well so you do what you can to try to be healthy I think it is a little bit more empowering as a physician when you get ill though because many times if you don't know like answer so to speak you probably know somebody who knows somebody who can get it for you and so it, it helps you to understand too. that's what dr williams come yeah. in at <laughs> yeah it helps you understand that um you know patients don't have that though so that's why it really gets on my on my last nerve when the patients go to me for a second opinion and they know nothing at all about their diagnosis and it's not their fault it means the other doctor didn't tell them what they should have told them and that's that's one reason why I try to make sure I do my level best to explain things as well as I can so the patient leaves there understanding what's going on because that's empowering for patients to understand their disease process. And, you know, you can't really make a good decision unless you have understanding and have information. So it's our job to give them information. So um, that's just, you know, one of the things that I think about sometimes when I think about my own illnesses and stuff like that, like, I have a lot of information at my disposal by virtue of having colleagues who are in different specialties, but the patients don't have that all the time. So it's my job to make sure they have as much information. And you mentioned something that's very important, Dr. Williams, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be involved in a program right now. I'm going to give my little shameless plug that not to put any physicians down or medical or health professionals down, but one of the things that we're working on is increasing health literacy from every angle, making sure that patients understand how to talk to their physicians and to know and to ask questions about their health. And then even for physicians, as you mentioned, the patient who patients who come to you and don't don't have a clue about the disease. And you have to literally almost probably start from from scratch and explaining to them what's going on with them. So we are working to increase or enhance uh, health literacy uh, in here in Jacksonville. And I hope that's something that any of our listeners will understand and, and really appreciate the importance of having a physician that you can talk to about anything, especially your primary care physician, because then they can help you navigate the specialists like Dr. Williams. Dr. Kane, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, as far as myself, no, but I will ask, I want to hear from Dr. Williams. Dr. Williams, um, one of our colleagues, Dr. KBJ, uh, uh, and for those uh, uh, individuals who may not know, Dr. Kim Barbell Johnson made a, a good uh, uh, statement, and that is that uh, the treatment for prostate cancer uh, with some of the treatment that's out there, what are some of the other uh, ill effects um, that may occur as a result of being treated for prostate cancer? I don't want to 
I want anybody to be afraid of being treated for prostate cancer, but just to be in the honest, uh, uh, honest sphere of uh, sphere, S P H E R E, honesty sphere of, um, of, of dealing with prostate cancer. Uh, when we use medications uh, to treat advanced patients with prostate cancer, I, you know, and Dr. Williams, you can. Uh, deal uh, even more so than I can, but you know, anti-testosterone drugs or whatever it may be. Uh, what what are some of the other uh, uh, serious uh, conditions that might you may see as a result of being treated for the prostate cancer, if there are any? Well, her, her comment was was pretty much targeted toward what we call androgen deprivation therapy. So, prostate cancer right. happens to be a cancer that is very sensitive to testosterone and predominantly uh -huh. testosterone. There are other androgens in the body, but, but testosterone is a primary one for men. And so it, it can grow uh, in the presence of testosterone so that if you can, if you can do away with the testosterone or, or, or diminish the amount of testosterone in the body, then many times the prostate cancer will, will kind of regress. It won't go away. Hormonal therapy will not cure prostate cancer, but it can be used to control prostate cancer for a time. And so predominantly, they're like, there are basically two scenarios in which you would use androgen deprivation therapy, where you are withdrawing the testosterone from the patient's body to try to control the prostate cancer. The, the first is with radiation therapies for um, for. Radi for prostate cancers that tend to be a bit more aggressive, such as the intermediate risk or the high risk prostate cancers, then radiation has been shown to, if you combine it with, with androgen deprivation therapy, it's been shown to uh, have, help the patients have better outcomes. And so many times that is prescribed for patients who are getting radiation therapy, external beam radiation therapy, and they can be getting it for anywhere for, I will say, six months to several years you know, uh, either in combination or after their radiation therapy. The other scenario in which you have you know, deprivation therapy is when the prostate cancer moves outside of the prostate. And at that point, it cannot be cured. Then you're only trying to control it. Um, so in any of those situations, when you're giving the androgen deprivation therapy, the, some of the side effects that people experience um, are the following. Um, it can weaken the bones. Uh, so osteoporosis type of pictures can occur. So that's why it's really important for people to uh, stay active and put weight on those bones um, and to take calcium supplementation and vitamin D um, to try to strengthen those bones. And in some cases, when the prostate cancer has spread to the bone already, then there are other medications that we can give um, to strengthen the bones because the bones uh, can be destroyed by the prostate cancer. But some of the other side effects of the, just the androgen deprivation themselves are like hot flashes. Like when women have um, uh, hot flashes because they have had menopause, men can have that too. It's called andropause. Um, but we, we're taking away the testosterone, so they have these hot flashes. Um, also, if people have like diabetes, uh, it can make the diabetes worse in some instances. Um, because you're taking away the testosterone, it can... Uh, cause uh, men to have uh, more issues with with test with uh, infections because so you're taking away testosterone, so it decreases their libido for one, but also makes it harder for them to get erections. Um, so there are a whole plethora of problems that go along with androgen deprivation therapy, um, and so we try to avoid it as much as we can. But like I said, in some instances, it's all we have um, to treat patients with, and then in the other instances, like I said, it's used for a shorter period of time to try to make the radiation work better. So every, you know, I always tell people every treatment option has some side effect that goes along with it. And, you know, we just try to find the one that, you know, fits the patient's disease and their quality of life as best we can. I want to uh, do real quick. Uh, I'm going to do the flip side of that because I tend to see it in my in terms of primary care. And, and Dr. Williams, you may have had some patients come in to you uh, uh, with some of the same concerns or issues. And that is those men who take androgen therapy, i.e. they take testosterone, whether or not it's because they're trying to be weightlifters or whether or not they think it's going to improve their libido, 
there, there are certain ill effects associated with that testosterone as it relates to their prostate health. And as you said earlier, um, the, uh, 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 for lack of better description, but in layman's term, testosterone can serve as a fertilizer uh, to feed that prostate cancer. And so men who may be taking this testosterone, these testosterone supplements, unneeded testosterone supplements, may tend to increase if, and you can correct me if I'm mistaken, their risk for developing prostate cancer. Any elaboration on that? So it's not thought that they are increasing their risk of, of developing prostate cancer, but if prostate cancer is there, it's then there. It, may, right. it, may, it may speed up its progression. And that's yeah. why before we start putting somebody on testosterone supplementation, we usually will check a PSA, do a rectal exam, you know, we're screening them for prostate cancer to make sure that we're not, you know, going to cause a problem. And then that's also why it's important once you started them on testosterone supplementation to periodically check that PSA um, to make sure that it's not going up, you know, and check the rectal exam. The other thing, there's some other things you have to, you, have to, you know, keep in mind uh, as well is that because the prostate cancer, um, not, excuse, not just prostate cancer, because the prostate itself can grow under the influence of testosterone. Men who mm -hmm. have prostate symptoms, those symptoms can be worsened uh, by testosterone therapy. So you have to be mindful of that as well um, and, and make people aware that, you know, when they start this testosterone, if you start having problems with, you know, the urination symptoms I talked about earlier, then it could be because of that testosterone. Uh, and so, you know, it's just, you have to strike that balance because it is important for men to have a, a, a healthy testosterone level in their bodies, especially if they're, you know, having symptoms uh, of, of hypogonadism or low testosterone, um, because it, it can it can benefit their tissues and other parts of their body as well to have amount of testosterone in the body. But at the same time, you know, there are other parts of the body like the prostate where it can cause some troubles, too. So you have to just make sure that you're checking up on those areas. Well, you know, that brings to mind because uh, a lot of times I have new patients come to see me. They were seeing other physicians. They come to see me and asking me, can I refill their testosterone supplements? And, I, and, and, and a lot of times we don't really appreciate under what conditions were they given those testosterone supplements. And uh, I do do the follow up like what you say in terms of the PSA and, um, and, and making sure I monitor other things. But uh, and then a lot of times I will send them off to you to see if that is truly needed, uh, this testosterone supplement, because I think that's the safest. Uh, that's my second opinion uh, in terms of uh, the, my patients being safe. When I send them off to a, a physician like yourself who can who uh, specialize in these things and can take a good look at uh, whether or not that patient needs it or don't need it. Uh, but I always like that second opinion because somebody else may have started them on it. And uh, sometimes I can get to the bottom and sometimes not. Uh, Ms. Turner? So are there certain foods or liquids that increase risk of prostate cancer? And I, I know you talked earlier, Dr. Williams, about a high-fat diet. Yeah, yeah, what I mentioned earlier, earlier is, is pretty much all that we know the most about in terms of being able to say that something uh, likely contributes to prostate cancer, but there are no specific, you know, foods that we know of um, or, or liquids that we know of that will increase somebody's risk of prostate cancer. And I want to ask one last question. It was a, a kind of a comment that also, and I've always thought of this, um, knowing that my dad had prostate cancer and I have two brothers and nephews is there some type of genetic test that can determine, and, and uh, uh, we had someone that wrote that, to determine if you're at risk for developing prostate cancer? You're already at risk, obviously, because your, uh, your father had prostate cancer, but is, is there a test? And you're black. <laughs> right. And you're black, right. Yeah. So there are, um, there are genetic tests that can be done, and they're, they're primarily focused on um, risk for, for high grade or aggressive prostate cancer. So most of the genetic tests are looking at different um, uh, 
oncogenes or different genes that are associated with cancer and especially mm-hmm. aggressive cancers. And if in and there are certain ones that go along with you know prostate cancer. Uh, surprisingly, uh, some of those are like the BRCA genes for breast cancer. There's a high linkage between that and prostate as well. Um, and, you know, that's one of the things that probably increases, uh, you know, African-Americans risk of, of having, you know, uh, worse outcomes with prostate cancer is because some of those genes that are associated with aggressive prostate cancer are found in, in, in uh, higher uh, levels in African-American men. But back to your question, though, there are, there are gene panels that will kind of group all of these kind of high risk genes in their panels and they'll do these blood tests to test for those. And those, those um, tests are recommended for people who have um, high risk prostate cancer, like for those family members and patients with these very aggressive prostate cancers. And also, um, you know, when there is a, um, uh, like a, a, predis- a predisposition for developing prostate cancer at early or any kind of those other kind of cancers too, like breast cancer and ovarian at very early ages, um, because, you know, there's something going on many times well before the age of normal screening or when you, when those things would come to, uh, to, to be known. And so in, in patients who, um, have those family histories, like I said, of those aggressive cancers at early ages, uh, and, and aggressive, uh, prostate cancer for sure, then those types of tests are recommended to be done to see if there might be a hereditary component to it. Thank uh, you. Ms. Turner, I had a patient ask me this. I got to make sure I ask this question <laughs> to Dr. Williams. I mean, I had my own answer. But the patient asked me earlier uh, this week, is, uh, that said he heard that there was no, uh, uh, that uh Prostate cancer can be detected without doing a digital rectal exam. And he asked me, was that true? Or do all, and, and, and then I also asked then, if that's the case, why do men need to have a DRE, a digital rectal, a Dr. Dre exam, as I call it, a digital rectal exam? <laughs> yeah, you definitely, <laughs> you can you can pick up some cancers with the PSA, and you can pick up some uh-huh. with the rectal exam. And you can also miss some with the PSA and miss some with the rectal exam. So the combination of the two gives you the best option or the best chance of detecting prostate cancer. Um, And so that's kind of the answer. You know, many men are trying to not have this rectal exam. And, yeah, you're just giving up, you know, some of the uh, the armamentarium for detecting disease. But, yes, you can just go with a PSA or you could just go with the DRE. But just understand that there's a good chance that you could be missing something. Especially such a killer like prostate cancer. Exactly. So uh, you I know, think people don't I realize how people, much of a killer it is. Right. I mean, I, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to say I understand. You know, people not wanting to have, um, uh, you know, rectal exams, um, but you know, honestly, women go through a whole lot more <laughs> in terms yeah. of their, uh, their, their physical exams and things of that sort than men do, and a rectal exam that takes a whole, you know, five seconds or six mm-hmm. seconds, something like that. I, I just don't understand if that can save your life, why that's such a big deal. So I don't let people off the hook. It's yeah. not a good thing for me. Hey, women get rectal, digital rectal exam plus. <laughs> exactly. Uh, compared yeah, exactly. to me. <laughs> well, so, you know, we've I have gone past... <laughs> Yeah, we've gone past our our hour, but the conversation has been so good. And Dr. Williams and and Roger, this this won't be the last time that we bring you on because we do want to have more discussion in the future about men's health. You know, those other health issues that men tend to neglect. And uh, so we'd like to give both of you an opportunity. And, and I feel so bad that Dr. Miller was having technical issues, but we definitely are going to bring him back on so that you can hear his story and and that we can have a conversation. As a matter of fact, Dr. Kane, if we can get Dr. Miller on next week, we may want to start the first part of our show in following up with Dr. Miller about this very important topic. But I would like to ask for ask Dr. Dr. Williams and Roger to give final thoughts. And Dr. Williams, in your final thought, we had a, a comment in the um, that asked about MRI in detecting prostate cancer. So listeners, 
also mention about MRI and detecting prostate cancer? Oh, sure. And I'm always happy to educate, um, you know, and I think that's a huge problem with, um, with, you know, cancer um, treatment, you know, because part of the treatment is, is the counseling too, you know, and I think that's a big problem is, is, you know, many doctors just don't have enough time. You know, I, I know some of them would give more time if they had it. It's just so, you know, it's such a time consuming thing to go into um, a great deal of discussion um, for a newly diagnosed prostate cancer or any kind of cancer patient. Um, but that's something that is a passion of mine. Um, and as far as the uh, MRI goes, so MRIs have gotten pretty good at looking for high risk or aggressive areas uh, of prostate cancer in the prostate, but they're far from perfect. You know, they're getting better and better and better, but we primarily use them as kind of an adjunct. So I'll tell you how I use it mostly. So if I have a patient that comes in who has a uh, elevated PSA, like I had a patient today, PSA was mm -hmm. like four and a half, like that. Then the first thing I want to do is I'm going to verify that that is high. So we'll get a repeat PSA um, to make sure that it's still high. Um, and then, you know, because we don't want to just biopsy everybody that has a, a little bit of a high PSA, then I may do a genomic test. And one of the genomic tests will look at either blood or urine, depending on which test you look at, to see, um, you know, if there are genes that are associated with aggressive prostate cancer in that patient's body. And if there's a certain, you know, amount of it, you get a, a high genomic score, we call, call it, then I say, okay, so this person is at high risk for having harboring aggressive prostate cancer. Now, I know I need to do a biopsy, but I don't want to miss if there's a high risk area. So then I'll get an MRI. And I'll get that MRI to see if there's a high risk area that I can target at the time of my biopsy, because most of the time we're targeting the peripheral zone of the prostate and that's where most of the cancers occur, but higher up in the prostate, um, in the area where, you know, BPH or enlarged prostate is, those are areas that are less likely to harbor cancer, but in some, um, uh, high risk individuals, we do find them up there. So I'll get the MRI to see if I need to go up there or go into an area where I might not be going typically to biopsy and, or just target a particular area that looks aggressive so that I can do the best biopsy that I can do for a patient. So currently use now. And I will yield the floor. Thank you all so much for the time you've given me. Roger, what are your final oh, thoughts? Well, um, I, I really appreciate and thank you for <clears throat> letting me to be on. I, I really uh, appreciate Dr. Williams uh, for his uh, thoroughness and expertise and his experts like him who are willing to give their time and Dr. Kane and um, uh, unfortunately Dr. Miller. And, and, and my whole uh, participation in this is to get the focus back on, uh, on men understanding and, and defeating some of the myths about uh, our health and not listening to the shade three doctors who you know, can tell you everything um, but the right thing about our health. And especially now that we're at a time uh, that medical uh, treatments are so good if you can get early detection. And so that's why we've been trying to reach young people to get them into understanding to uh, have annual checkups and uh, not be afraid to go to the doctor because knowledge truly is power. And, you know, we say in, 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 the, in churches, you often hear God has not given us a spirit of fear, but there are a whole lot of men out there that are fearful um, about the knowledge that can help them and save them. And so that's what we want to overcome. And um, thank you all for inviting me. Thank you all for what you do. And um, anytime you need um, a fourth wheel, I'll be more than happy to be here. Or a fifth wheel, I'll be more than happy to be here. <laughs> Oh, Dr. Kane, <laughs> what are your well, final thoughts about this? Uh, yeah, okay, well, I'll say this. Uh, uh, thanks to Dr. Williams and Reverend Williams uh, for participating in our event. I'm going to buy Herman a new phone as soon as I get my own new phone. <laughs> um, and, uh, <laughs> Dr. Miller, I'm going to buy him a new phone. Uh, I hope he don't hold me to that. Uh, but anyway, uh, what I will say, is, it is nice to know that, that, that we have people in the community 
like uh, Reverend Williams and Dr. Williams, who uh, just uh, I saved it to the end, the best to last, happens to be my doctor uh, <laughs> uh, and take care of me and my issues. Um, just to be appreciative that as especially in in our neck of the woods, as we see more African-Americans with uh, health issues and we have greater access to to remedies for some of these health issues. It's, it, it's good to see that at that, that you know, the light in the, in the tunnel where we have very competent, qualified experts like Dr. Williams. And uh, I am very happy to uh, have him as part of uh, my treatment plan, personal treatment plan, but also as far as it relates to uh, my patient's treatment plan, because when I send patients to him, I can count on getting an honest answer. We may have a discussion about it, but I can count on him giving me the most factual and honest answer that he can, that uh, he's, that's available to me. So, and I take his advice, not with a grain of salt. I take it with, with great pleasure to help, help me uh, treat my patients. So with that, I'm going to uh, shut my mouth and, and, Oh, let everybody know that we will be, we're going to, you know, we're steady building our website. And so a lot of this information we plan on posting on the website, some additional information for prostate cancer. Ms. Turner. And I would like to give a, a, a final shameless plug to the Healthy Jacksonville Men's Health Coalition, which Roger chairs and that if anyone would be interested in joining the movement, as I call it, in addressing men's health, then go to our website at healthyjaxmen.org. Again, healthyjaxmen.org and get involved in the movement, if not for yourself, for your own family members and ladies that include you. And I would like to just say again, as Dr. Kane has echoed, thank you, Dr. Williams, Dr. Christopher Williams with Urology Consultants, and Dr. Herman Miller with the Woman's Choice of Jacksonville, who, are ha who was having some technical issues, and Reverend Roger Williams with Philip, our cousin, AME Church, and representing the Healthy Jacksonville Men's Health Coalition. Thank you all. Good evening. Thank you for tuning in today to Pause for the Truth. We hope that you gain more knowledge about today's topic and that you will tune in next time to hear about what's trending and what you can do to help us make life a little less complicated for you and your family. Growing our presence allows us to reach more people, so we need your support. Visit our website at www.pauseforthetruth.com. Like us on Facebook, tweet us on Twitter, link with us on LinkedIn, but most of all, download the Podbean app to your mobile device and become a follower of Pause for the Truth. We have dedicated our careers to sharing knowledge. Now we ask you to pay it forward and invite others to Pause for the Truth. You can email questions or show topics, recommendations to us at info at pauseforthetruth.com. We would also like to give a hearty thank you to our behind-the-scenes technology engineer, Mr. Tyrone Jackson. You can contact him for your technological needs at www.calltyrone.net. Until next time, stay well, stay safe, and always remember, take time out to pause for the truth. This is Dr. Rogers Kane and Ms. Jocelyn Turner signing off until next week. Thank you.